Her current projects are focused on the sorts of claims that populations deemed diasporic make on states and how this reconfigures their communities and general sociocultural practices. Her work has long engaged, as you can imagine then, the problematics of globalization, local global articulations, and, the, and, uh, the, uh, and capitalism's social and historical formations in the Americas. Professor Critchlow has published widely and across disciplinary boundaries, beautifully navigating, I might add, interdisciplinary research. Among her books are uh, three that I want to uh, bring up in particular because they are particularly important contributions to both Caribbean studies and also interdis interdisciplinary, excuse me, I'm tired, interdisciplinary research in the Americas. Uh, one book that she has uh, written that's quite wonderful is Negotiating Caribbean Freedom, Peasants and the State in Development, and that's in 2005. And basically this book is a critique of development projects that examines the discursive and political relationships between uh, uh, contemporary Jamaican smallholders, that is land-based working people, and the Jamaican state. In this monograph, Professor Critchlow analyzes how development dominates the lives of subsistence peasantry, not by naked domination, but through the instrumentalization of local and traditional social relationships. The second book, uh, of which we have, uh, many of us in here have read recently, uh, is Globalization and the Post-Creole Imagination, Notes on Fleeing the Plantation. And this, in this book, Professor Critchlow critiques the key sacred cows of creolization studies. And she argues that because creolization's local expressions necessarily articulate with other creole manifestations in the wider world, including beyond the transatlantic, excuse me, transnational Atlantic, which is still a little bit incendiary. It's a position that I actually adore, but it's still a little uh, incendiary. She argues that the Caribbean is best viewed as an entangled portal rather than a bounded site. She argues that we also need to correct transnationalism studies' misguided underestimation of conservative influences that may underpin transnational identities. And rather than simply focusing on the a utopian subvers subversiveness that allegedly inherit them. In, and she says we can begin to do this um, uh, uh, correction by fleeing the plantation, that is, escaping the historical and intellectual constraints imposed on creolization processes. These constraints really amount to the favorite intellectual points of departure that scholars use repeatedly, the plantation, slavery, indenture, etc. Using life histories, Professor Critchlow argues, against the still common grain, we, can't, uh, we, we, we realize that we can't predict what kinds of communities and thus identities will emerge through transnational processes. And then, of course, she goes on to talk about how to then look at those transnational processes in a way that does justice to this energy of unexpectedness and emergence outside of confining binaries. And lastly, I wanted to uh, just point out her, uh, a book that precedes these two, a co-edited volume that Professor Critchlow uh, did with uh, Farouk Tabak on, uh, called Informalization, Process and Structure. And it's really quite an important study of informalization or the growth and development of informal economies under global capitalism ranging from the 14th to the 20th centuries. So you can see that Professor Critchlow has really engaged, as I said, the issues of globalization and local global articulations and capitalism, social and historical formations in the Americas in quite diverse and fascinating ways. So if you would please join me now in giving a warm welcome to Professor Michaeline Critchlow. I, I just want to, to recognize the passing of my collaborator, um, Farouk Tabak, uh, a couple of years ago, um, we collaborated on informalization, as uh, Aisha said, and it's been a really, I think, very important work. But Farouk uh, um, 
also worked on the Mediterranean, um, did a wonderful book on the rise and decline of the Mediterranean. Unfortunately, he um, passed away just when it uh, came out. So if you're interested in the Mediterranean, it's a really thorough, thoroughly researched and very um, exciting um, text. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, since most of you have, uh, or many of you have, are familiar with some aspect of um, globalization and the post cruel imagination notes on fleeing the plantation, I'm sort of, um, I don't know, I'm, being, I'm, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to, 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 to go there, but I, but I shall anyway, um, and perhaps somewhere along the line um, raise some uh, issues that are emerging in my current project, which looks at the um, quest for citizenship, um, heterogeneous places like the Dom Dominican Republic, Fiji, and South Africa, um, through the issue of land and just uh, basic uh, um, ideas about um, belonging as well, not necessarily citizenship in the legal sense of the term, but what I use in the text, citizenness, that's a striving for a kind of dignity and so on, where I'm looking at the Haitians in the Dominican Republic, but also in dialogue with vulnerable Dominicans as well. And I think the, that sort of dialogue um, is, is sort of overlooked that there are also large numbers of Dominicans in the Dominican Republic that are fundamentally stateless themselves, undocumented. But we, we can come to that um, at some point. I want to also uh, recognize the collaboration of Patricia Northover in my text. Um, we had been working, as I said, in the preface on a project um, for the Rural Sociological, World Rural Sociological Association, and I had sort of brought in, um, we collaborated on this rather incredible paper that just kept going and going and going. And then in, in the aftermath of that, I thought perhaps we'd been talking and having a lot of discussion about uh, creolization and so on. I thought, hey, why? Life is short. Why don't we just pull these ideas into into this text and see what happens? You know. So Pat has been very um, very helpful, and, and and since then we've we've become sort of uh, collaborative collab collaborative on several um, forthcoming um, projects. Um, Pat is is a philosopher and a development economist uh, trained at. Cambridge, so coming at things in a very different and, and exciting for me um, way. Creolization, Americanity, or the Americas in the world system um, draws, of course, on the recently published text, Globalization, Post-Creole Imagination, and um, which, as you know, is an, and as Aisha mentioned, is an intervention into discussions of Caribbean sociocultural practices gathered under the rubric of creolization, which, to summarize Truyo's um, definition, is, re reflects or relates to processes of selective creation and cultural struggle. It picks up also on a few elements in, in my current work attempting to think about the imaginaries at work in the politics of placement and displacement in the Caribbean, in parts of the Pacific, Pacific and in South Africa. The t this talk is sort of interlocuted and it's in, and the text perhaps, and perhaps it's my enduring, it's a, um, you know, part of the course having been trained at Binghamton with <laughs> under Wallerstein and, 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 and Arigi and the late um, Terence Hopkins, that there, there's something there that I want to um, dialogue with all the time. I was not very a happy campo with world systems as in the neo in the classical sense of the term so i'm always sort of going back to that for some um strange reason so it's interlocuted by the um especially by the very productive article that came out several several years ago 1992 or 1993 by Kihano and Wallerstein called Americanity as a concept or the Americas in the modern world system 
in, in their perspective, I'm, I'm looking essentially at the ways in which they are, you know, they've, they've sort of conceptualized newness. In their perspective, the resistance of the Americas um, against the globalizing tendencies of capital and of the interstate system is not necessarily framed by the sociocultural reservoir of a traditionally grounded historicity, but by the flight to modernity. This is an important perspective, I believe, yet the, the, way th the ways in which they characterize this f flight seems to be too narrowly interpreted as a sheer pragmatic or historical necessity. This narrow reading is evident from their view that the flight to modernity came about largely because the Americas were unlike the peripheral zones of Europe where the strength of the existing agricultural communities and of their indigenous nobilities was considerable, allowing them to frame or structure their cultural resistance in terms of a certain historicity. So in other words, it seems that the argument here is that the Americas certainly lacked that kind of historicity, and so they were forced to, almost in a default kind of mode, to sort of frame their response to a certain kind of exploitation, a certain kind of mode of being, in, you know, futuristically. For Kihano and Wallerstein then, the widespread destruction of indigenous populations of the Americas and with them their fabled historicities force a mass, a mass recourse to a Euro modernity. All subjects of the Americas therefore entered a system of ideological, cultural and economic production that ethnicized populations hierarchically and promised abundance via material consumption and though reinforcing various social and political inequalities touted liberal democracy and equality. As this argument goes later in the post-war period when the United States assumed the mantle of a global hegemonic power its ideological, cultural, and political fundamentals became integral to the modern world economy. Despite advances in that material production, the tenets of coloniality continued to hold sway in this reorganized social order. It seemed as if, they argue, Americanity was the erection of, gig of a gigantic ideological overlay to the modern world which established a series of institutions and worldviews that sustained the system, and it invented this all out, uh, this out of the American crucible. While the analysis above carries with it a certain erasure of the degrees of freedom or difference at play in the hem hegemonic mapping of the present, it highlights nonetheless the violence and the disruptiveness of the world in which Caribbeans were caught up in and through which they would seek to chart their place, their subjectivities and their imaginations of post-Creole spaces. Our interpretations of the processes of creolizations offered, er, offered indeed limits the sense in which one may proffer an outside to those entangled in this incipient modernity after being caught up in the violent vortex of its formation. Nonetheless, one may argue that certainly histories were disrupted, as well as prior dwelling places in the formation of the Americas, which induced the stitching together of heterogeneous times, of heterogeneous spaces, of heterogeneous bodies in the complex articulations of modern insides and imagined other sides marking or mapping the spaces and times of entanglement. And I would like to come back to a sort of visual rendition of this idea of entanglement in, a, in due course. Moreover, the diverse, often promiscuous spaces and sociocultural practices that were being produced through the processes of uprootings and rehomings in the context of modern space represented contesting possibilities that challenge the future of these Atlantic spaces and places. What, what I seek to challenge in this idea of, you know, Americanity is the sort of passivity that attends the notion of the making of newness. 
And I think that one of the ways we can tackle it, and this article really is uh, an, an example of uh, a certain uh, a world systems perspective, which sort of indirectly or perhaps unwittingly, given you know certainly the presence of Kihano, especially who's dealt with you know coloniality of populations, unwittingly sort of rehearses a certain kind of fait accompli that we are sort of inhabiting the spaces that, um, the, and then we are sort of contesting these spaces rather than a sort of active engagement that attends the production of newness, but not newness per se, newness in the quest for a certain kind of homely, uh, ho um, a homing. And I think that the concept of creolization as adopted in the text may help to sort of rectify, rectify that kind of perspective, um, that sort of passive perspective, but also center the agency of the, um, the Amer Americans writ large, people of the Americas, certainly in this instance we're looking at a portion of the Americas, certainly the, the Caribbeans in the Americas, but I think um, that it's very possible and quite productive to sort of, you know, use that concept, Caribbean slash Americans. Of course, place matters, and so there are obviously um, historical differences throughout the Americas, but nonetheless, I think we can generalize productively in, in that way. The project is, is, is attempting to sort of in, uh, extend the notion of creolization beyond its origins. But it's not attempting to eradicate or erase the specificity of Caribbean heterogeneous um, places. So my argument really hinges on a project that's designed to redirect the terms of creolization debates in ways that speak to the journeys towards the refashioning of self, times and places in the intertwinement of global and local processes. So it's at once attentive to sort of individual imaginaries, but also social imaginaries as well. Um, so it encompasses, you know, the idea of, you know, met a method that pays attention to the, you know, the, the, the location of peoples as a collective, but also the sorts of imaginations that individuals and peoples attend to that, that, that production of places that generated these subjectivities in the first place. <clears throat> so the goal is not to jettison the idea of creolization's rhizomic rootings in the Caribbean, but rather wish to treat the constructions of these groundings relationally. Relationally, that is, as articulations of spaces and peoples whose places of enunciation and sociocultural practices have been cited within a global frame entangling, so to speak, modern power and its subjects as contesting yet inseparable autonomies. This repositioning of the discourse on creolization opens up the possibility of exploring the Caribbean. I think this is really crucial unencumbered by what Irit Rogoff calls three really burdensome models. The three burdensome models, the impositions of geography, of geographical location, the nation state and local identity, and the legacies of colonialism that establish a binary opposition with colonial powers. Thus, rather than reconfiguring exhausted debates about Creole identity per se, constructs which are inescapably enmeshed in essentialisms and secreted from a perspective on culture as possession and end product. The approach here that we've adopted is to explore identity as something profoundly incoherent as well as critically pragmatic by locating the Caribbean's experience as an entangled site and a portal. Seeing creolization in this fashion requires a vision of such, such torn experiences as liminal states and a limbo gateway, gateway, as Wilson Harris, the novelist, suggests, burdened with the possibilities that spatial thresholds offer for experiencing liminal transformation. It indeed, indeed is through this violent ritual of crossing that those whose lives have been staked in the present seek to remake the incoherencies of cosmologies of presence through a more or less open-ended forging of new world processes contingent on the politics of space and place 
indeed contingent on une poétique de la relation. Can the idea of creolization still hold is a critical question in an era when there are no plantations of the type at least that were central to the birthing of the Atlantic world. Its differential systems of economic and cultural productions. Are we to commit the same error as New World theories who in post-plantation eras resorted to conceptualizing MNCs as new types of plantations, thereby obscuring the newness in the economy of the changing social relations and the changing directions of subjectivities. Such an intellectual strategy, I think, is, an, is questionable. As noted, the technologies of the global and Creole culture continue to evolve outside of the structures and strictures of the plantation in the process of becoming like that of identity formation, as Stuart Hall would say. Even as one recounts the horror stories of Haitians, particularly cane workers in the Dominican Republic, can one say that they function within reconstituted plantation complexes, knowing that those earlier plantations had a specific transnational mercantile connection that is absent today? knowing that the sugar regimes of the past no longer exist. Likewise, are Haitians really in the Dominican Republic slaves as were, were their foreparents? I think the answer is no. So that universalizing from earlier global um, condition, and we see this, appear, uh, uh, this idea of slavery emerging constantly, for example, in the discourses of human trafficking People speak to the idea of a, a new kind of slavery, and I'm sort of wondering exactly, um, interrogating that sort of, I know it's, it's, it's a, a very good strategy to be used by activists, certainly, to call attention to the similarities. But I think it's our duty as uh, scholars also to look at the sorts of variations and to understand the evolution and evolutionary aspects of those forms of, you know, coerced, at, in, at some level coerced, at some level um, um, wittingly, unwittingly uh, coerced uh, labor. I think Achille Mbembe's construes contemporary African realities as happening in a time of entanglement, in a time that is not a chronological unity, but a range of disjointed moments, practices, and symbols that thread the historical relations between events and narrative. And this could likewise be said of contemporary Creole conditioning in the Caribbean. Indeed, the performance of various often disparate forms of national identities, along with the production of new sites on which such identities are transformed and reformed, is a common occurrence in many Caribbean um, places, lending those places the tenor of an eBay site on which every ideology and expedient is up for action, auction and may be bought to suit the moment, whether it's government, anti-government, church, anti-church, anti-development, pro-consumerism. Hello? Hi, your computer is running on the back. Oh. Do you have a church? Yeah, I think so. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's in there. It's in there. Somewhere, I hope. No? Yeah. The question is this. Why in these contemporary global times should particular Creole practices and expressions pers persist? Is it still useful to imagine that Creolization is plantation-centered, or is it still useful to imagine that Creolization is a Caribbean thing? In a post-plantation context, what happens to Creolization processes? How Creole are rural Caribbeans for whom country and Western music has become the staple of their localness. And I'm, I'm very, <laughs> you know, uh, Dale Tomich, who was doing research in Martinique, said that he was um, listening to St. Lucian radio one day and he was surprised by the fact that there was so much country and Western coming forth. I remember also doing some research for the University of Wisconsin in Choiselle, a rural community in, in um, 
in St. Lucia and <laughs> I decided that okay fine we, we should have a party to mark our, our departure and the local folks said okay yeah and lots of um, country and western and I said no way no country and western and they said how can you not have country and western and I was thinking what a strange researcher I am I've been here for uh, six months and not realized the impo Im importance and impact of country and western music to um, St. Lucian rural folks the same folks who said to me you can't speak English here we don't speak English here so you better you know, get with the, the Creole, get with the Patois, as they say. We, we're not speaking. And these, some of these people were actually people who had lived in England for more than 40 years. So I, I, I thought, what is going on in England? You know, <laughs> who are these people talking with? Was there not a pan-Caribbean thing going on there? Which means a pan-Caribbean dominated by Jamaicans who are speaking versions of English, yes. But English, you know, what happened? Did they not communicate at all with these people? What is going on here? And of course, they weren't. <laughs> they don't like Jamaicans anyway. Um, <laughs> the, the, that, was, that was their thing. And anyway, um, the, so this, you know, I'm dealing, the, the, this, this is a level, this is sort of the texture of, you know, the complexity of, for, for um, hetero, a heterogeneous process of, of creolization happening there, the localization of um, country and western, the, um, the contempt towards other parts of the Caribbean for one reason or, or other, and the the, the, the migration to England that nonetheless doesn't unseat the, 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 the centrality of language. In, in other words, it's so, as if Stéphane Palmier is correct to suggest that you know, Caribbeans who have migrated actually treat the host country as the periphery and the, their country as the core. So it's always that sort of ambivalent, but um, 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 strange ways of, uh, uh, different ways rather, of interacting and connecting with uh, the, 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 um, the place. So how is place problematized? And I think how does the post-creole imagination um, problematize place? And why, is, why should, um, why is it important that place be problematized for those reasons especially? So this idea of creolization that we advance in the text, it problematizes this place making and it calls for a perspective that embraces a larger global space for understanding Caribbean creole consciousness well beyond the black Atlantic while being nonetheless mindful of the possible time, space, and habitus limits to the chains of modern freedoms. But it goes further than that and suggests that this particular view of creolization offers a way for scholars to think, rethink place beyond the physicality of, of space. Place, therefore, in this context, is treated using the Heideggerian concept of Dasin as the capacity to be, to be present. This rethinking of creolization demonstrates that even when we think a place as a distinct location, we have also to critically examine the way in which it has become, it has come to be entangled in different relationships that may emanate elsewhere. And I think the cultural geographies are also thinking place in similar ways. In other words, in this instance, rethinking Caribbean sociocultural practices contributes not only to understanding the region as a particular location, but that particularity allows us to locate its global dimensions as well. So it's a, it's a textured way of thinking space that is not at all essentialized to a kind of physical location, but recognizes the networking that has constituted that specific site and the sorts of narratives that engage in the very contestatory ways in suggesting that no, it does not, this, this did not happen or that did not, but contesting, contesting narratives of, 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 um, of place. In other words, uh, by virtue of this relationality, this allows us to posit the productiveness of the concept of creolization for apprehending processes of being elsewhere beyond the Americas and ultimately beyond the Atlantic. 
Creolization as a process then of a particular projection of cultural power in the Caribbean and Americas generally within the context of Atlantic slavery and indentureship gives the Caribbean within the Americas its special historical cultural character. As has been pointed out by a number of, of scholars, the Caribbean was central to the forging of modern, a modern Atlantic economy through its, role as, through its role as a producer of sugar with African slaves, later with Indian indentured servants and other migrants including Portuguese, Chinese, Javanese, Middle Eastern Jews and Arabs. And if like Charles Wigley we include Brazil, particularly its northeastern section, Japanese, all of whom service in one way or another the slave sugar industry in Plantation America. As Mintz and Price and late and others like Michel Rothrouillou have noted, this miracle of creolization was reflected in the sorts of cultures that were created in the wake of New World slavery. The practices of slaves were not so much a reflection, solely a reflection of continuities and survivals of Africanisms as Herskovitz posits, but were the results of the refashioning of selves and communities that such new locations necessitated. And, and um, w a musical uh, example of this is, is Winston Marsalis's Blood on the Fields. I don't know if you're familiar with that jazz. Um, album that won for the first time the Pulitzer Prize, not for the first time, jazz album winning for the first time the Pulitzer Prize. When was that? In 19... the 2000 or something like some in the early 2000. But it's actually a very beautiful, um, it's almost like an, an opera of sorts. And uh, there th this um, slave who's obviously of noble heritage and he's re re refusing to, to grapple with his current state in the new world and his, his uh, another slave who's uh, Cassandra Wilson in acting, uh, act, um, singing to him saying look you just have to deal with the reality as it is you can't just keep thinking thinking back just try to you know make do with and certainly you know one one, one these conversations I don't think are necessarily uh, I, I think th these these were common conversations, I think, that must slaves might have, you know, um, engaged in. You know, thinking about how to deal with this, <laughs> how to deal with this current crisis that they find themselves in. So that I think this, this the blood on the fields is a spectacular um, an, um, album that I was also very much um, uh, thinking about when I was writing this as well. So there's this, there's this asymmetrical power within these Atlantic labor organizations and these asymmetrical organizations uh, constituted by people who seek to creatively as well build their own places of comfort or to sustain a dwelling with power. So you're not drawing on this idea of resistance constantly but a dwelling with power. How do you dwell with a certain kind of power? Um, in this process then of remaking their place in the world, remaking their place in the world or in the rediscovering or rediscovering their futures, they attempt to transform such conditions and set in motion new processes often borrowing from various places and social spaces while ut utilizing multivalent strategies and styles which destabilize and morph given spaces and temporalities. Yet, as Romberg notes, the nature of such transformations and its agents, motives and products are by no means agreed upon. So there's that turbulence as, you know, it's a Scots notion of, of tradition as constantly um, a contestatory sort of uh, um, discourse. Perhaps in the light of this absence of the theoretical de determination, despite the concept's history of intense inter interrogation combined with the weight of human entanglements, that I think creol creolization as an idea travels well. It is not surprising then that creolization is now being presented as a harbinger of the cultural fusions or practices of hybridity that are said to characterize the socio-cultural face of contemporary globalization. In particular, the concept of creolization has been controversially lifted to refer more broadly to the socio-cultural fusions and cultural pastiches now held to be characteristic of various parts of the world economy.
while certainly limited in its power to describe the nature of social life in contemporary globalization, and while also overshadowing the political processes at work in these cultural encounters and convivial practices, this current deployment of the concept may nonetheless prove itself useful, at least to the degree that it helps to dislodge the reading of creolization through a specifically plantation fulcrum and to the extent that it helps to highlight parallel sociocultural networks and relational constructions that extend within and beyond and sometimes in spite of the constraining originary locations of identities, ethnicities, and experiences. Moreover, such a new usage of the term would, pro would hopefully provoke an extension of the discussion of creolization beyond explantation societies, beyond the Caribbean, and beyond the Americas as it should be. Certainly, people across the world increasingly exhibit an eBay imaginary with the ability to enlarge choice sets more prevalent now than before through such choices. Those such choices are construed within and constrained by the context of particular socioeconomic and cultural class and racial positions in spaces crisscrossed by diverse diasporic practices and displaced others. So in the context of this productive, if we adopt the idea, if we dislodge it from this plantation location and we understand creolization as a creolization in the world as opposed to the world in creolization, which is to say that we take into consideration the ideas, uh, you know, cultures of power as critical to the ways in which people imagine and reimagine and remake, refashion their spaces. In this context, then, of this productive, it becomes a very productive concept. Um, in, this, in the context of this productive and unsettled ferment on the nature of creolization and its entanglements with the process of globalization for our part, we'd like to offer a set of perspectives, and that's what we do in the text, that we believed can advance this discussion of this twinned phenomena. In particular, we seek to shift the ways in which creolization, an outcome of distinct powers and um, cultural practices entangled in plantation America has been understood by moving away from these locales, cultural groups, and distinctive cultural end products, but engaging them as well. Thinking creolization and its processes of cultural transformation largely through these terms has provoked a torrent, as you probably know, of heated debates about the essential nature of experiences within creolization and creole societies. So the aim here then is to redirect these debates in ways that speak to you know, journeys of refashioning of, of selves, times. And we do this by offering a theory of creolization. I think it's necessary to, to, to theorize it so that it can be productively used in other locations. And to also understand the, the, the dynamics of Caribbean socioculture or sociocultural practices. And taking into cont uh, context these earlier ideas about you know, slavery and whatnot, we argue for an understanding of creolization as an inherently dynamized process of selective creations and cultural struggles, as through your posited that reaches far beyond the enclaves, again, of the plantation via critical mimetic movements shaping a politics of making place, a process of cultural morphogenetics, and the homing of modern freedom. So it's, the idea is to uh, try to get to an uh, understanding of creolization as a politics of place, making place, a politics of making place. And politics of making place, uh, these politics, you know, politics of making places are ve very much a world phenomenon. Mm? This idea of dynamizing in order to theorize creolization as subject and problematic is certainly underpinned by Michel Rolf Tuyo's very timely and important appeal to social scientists to treat the miracle of creolization the slaves in particular express in the ingenuity of their survival of survival as fundamentally historicized a historicized process of selective creation and cultural struggle 
This is interpreted here as a politics of making place and relatedly spaces and presence, or at least traces of it. This creolization may be broadly interpreted then as a creative evolutionary process expressing modern projects of the selective making of modern subjects. This is what is absent in the whole Quijano and Wallerstein conceptualization of the unis, u, 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 uniqueness of America in the world uh, economy and the impact of America in the formation of the world uh, Atlantic, at least Atlantic-led, if you will, world economy. We draw then attention to a sort of genealogical space of a history of the present. And draws atten drawing attention also to the social uh, and political processes. It seems like a process of writing in a field, on a field of entangled and confused parchments on documents that have been scratched over and recopied many times. In the context of social histories then, these texts that we think are you know, copied over and scratched over are uh, the bodies, we refer to the cultural bodies or, subs or subjects that are inscribed in social space that become marked by the etchings of hegemonic and countering histories in the making and unmaking of modern subjects so that people are basically what we're saying ba here is that people are constantly you know struggling to reposition themselves and then become marked by these particular sets of processes and as they move from one point to the other they become marked again so it's always a scratching and a recopying and a refashioning that's taking place which suggests you know uh, underscores the idea that creolization is a very is historicized and it's a highly dynamized um, project. The colonial and post-colonial body presents a particularly bloody example of those processes of, of etching in the entangled writing of the history of the present, but as colo post-colonial studies have highlighted, such sites also record practices of mimesis and alterity or liminal dialectics of staying and leaving in order to move and transfigure oneself through spaces of power. This is expressed, for example, in the politics of fracturing of the imagined community of the nation by realizing that to blaspheme is to dream or by suffering for territory in homestake in presence in the liminal spaces of the modern between the here and there. Our sense then of creolization in the world as opposed to the world in creolization, we believe thus escape simplistic readings of creolization as mere global melting pots of cultural hybridity and point towards instead an interpretation through a politics of mapping the present to use Eldon's apt phrase. So any advance then in the study of creolization will require inquiry into the historical, spatial and ethnographic context anchoring these processes of selective creation and cultural struggle and in an investigation also of the complex interdependencies that are shaping them. So our argument therefore rests on the idea that one's, one needs to complicate the processes involved in the formation of the Caribbean region within the Atlantic economy through analyses that emphasize relationality, relational spaces of the strategical power relationships embedded in the making of places which Tomich, Dale Tomich underscored. For what Tomich ultimately argues for is a method that's grounded in a spatial history which interrogates how places like the Caribbean were being complexly constituted and indeed part of a process of mutual constitution and entangled histories to the extent that they were linked to seas and ports and other places via plantations, via their labor, via their bodies, via the products that were produced in such places, all of which were part and parcel of the making and unmaking of the Atlantic space. So these complex historical realizations then involve paying close attention to the multiple streams of spatial influences that have disturbingly fed Caribbean people's living memories and post-creole imaginations as they negotiated 
and contested these spaces of modern power as well as its configurations and calibrations of their degrees of freedom. I'd like to say too that such multiple streams in processes of this creative adaptation and cultural struggle are caught up in but go well beyond the fixed diasporic roots that encounter the Black Atlantic or some such similar derived ethnic identities. And more generally then, depend on particular historical, spatial, and ethnographic contexts and their endowments of necessities and contingencies, resources, constraints, conjunctures, disjunctures that shape and enable sort of transactional, the ways in which people transact their mode of being in the world at different places and different times. So these emphases then on entanglements, you see the Caribbean as this sort of very, like many places, a very entangled history, specific history, not any and every history, with specific sets of peoples nonetheless. This idea of entanglements then and, multi, uh, and multiplicity in emergent historical processes which creolization discourses have sought to interpret and unravel have led us to argue like Tomich for a method of analysis that presents, and I quote, a unified, a multidimensional and relational approach to the spatial history of creolization. This therefore implies a deeper exploration of the relational spaces of these sets of strategical power relationships embedded in the making of places and related spaces which give rise to the experiences of creolization as un poétique de la relation. In brief then, the nature of modern creolization processes, the politics of making place, will be expressions of historically contingent and strategic complexly entangled and situated politics of selective creation and cultural struggle to define and express place and relatedly present to produce spaces and its foldings of the present. So the idea um, of the Tomich's model then I think is sort of very crucial. It was sort of designed to undermine the earlier sets of ideas that are contained, for example, in that uh, Kihano and uh, Wallerstein piece, very productive and lovely piece, um, to speak, to center the idea of agency, but also to center the ways in which, you know, the world system is not a given fait accompli, but is constantly in the making. And we sort of, perhaps one could argue the theorizing here that we are advancing operates at a sort of middle level if you will, but it, a middle level that very much reconstitutes the way in which you look at the Atlantic um, space. What does it mean to historicize creolization? Through your calls for studies that transcend simplistic and naturalized invocations of history, and for history to be interwoven into analyses of creolization as it affected various territories and plantations. He proposes four contexts. The first context, the frontier context, and the second, a plantation context, and an enclave context, and a modernist context. He defines the frontier context as a pre-plantation situation. What was it like in those countries before the plantation become institutionalized as a dominant mode or one of the modes of production? The duration, he says, of these contexts, contact, sorry, may have affected the emergence of Creole languages. For example, in the plantation context, as, which is what we're probably more familiar with, the in the context of Creolization um, discourses, the plantation is the primary determinant of life during and immediately after centuries of legalist enslavement. Of course, this varies throughout the Caribbean. The enclave context refers to the relative isolation, for example, in the maroon 
Maroon communities. The modernist context for trio refers to processes of creolization following the decline of the plantation, slavery, and colonialism, which, according to him, offers a different kind of technical and institutional support to creolization. So that's the basically the idea of historicizing it, understanding the particular context in which whatever happens in what in particular sets of territories and not simply territories, but he, 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 he states in no uncertain terms that there's, not, there's no such thing as the plantation, <laughs> you know, there were several different kinds of chants. So there's that need for a certain kind of, what should I say, thick description to use Geertz's concept here to understand the nature of creolization um, processes. So he, in tracing these various experiences of creolization, he calls for one to recognize, articulate, and unsilence the indifferences of global history that have bound Creoles creating the conditions for linked differences within and among complex creolization processes. And just to underscore and briefly get on to the other point, the focus then on locales ought to be considered within the supra-register of global history's connectedness and its effects upon the production of difference. I want to skip over the generalization since it deals basically with understanding the attempt to generalize, and I think I've mentioned that, to a discussion, brief discussion of what it means to creolization dynamize, since the model really hinges on this dynamization of the, the concept. And takes us back again to an understanding, uh, a subversion really, of the interpretation of Kihano and um, Wallerstein. It was through Dale Tomich's work that the idea um, we discussed, Pat and I discussed the ways in which the, the world, um, world systems analysis privileges an, an overdetermined notion of the economy. So it's the power of the economy that sort of underscores the ways in which the model is defined or, or and uh, uh, the, analy the underscores the analytical model of the, mo of the world systems, you know, core periphery, semi-periphery. It's all about, you know, economic um, factors, variables. And Tomich was one of the uh, more productive critiques of this model. And he argues that um, both the modes of production thesis and the world systems thesis operate on the same terrain. He says, you know, instead we need attention to the specificity of forms of social production allows us to comprehend the world economy not simply as a sum of its parts or as an abstraction over and above them, but as distinct relations among particular social forms and material processes of production. And I think this was a real, I think for me anyway, at, at any rate, a breakthrough in thinking productively about how to surpass and transcend but 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 uh, pay respect as well to the world systems model I think um, you know in the Atlantic studies or Pacific studies or global studies uh, that is that are now considered quite um, in vogue there's a certain kind of ignor ignoring of that earlier work that was done by Wallerstein and his group of people at Binghamton Historical Sociology uh, Department that sought to see the world in, as a unity. It was on the terms in which the, the, uni the unity was premised that, that that really was the problem. But to see the world as, as um, to see the Caribbean as part of a global world, to see, uh, the, uh, to, to argue basically that you're looking at global processes when you're looking, doing specific sets of ethnographic or historical work, and therefore to pay attention to the sorts of networks that places uh, are, are um, flowing through places or the flows that network certain places in larger sets of spaces. I think that's that's very crucial and uh, certainly the idea of globalization has sort of brought that up again um, at least the more productive um, studies um, on globalization. 
Tometry's work recognized the inner and outer localities of the global, global and it grasped these spaces as relational. It's their complex interdependent workings, he said, that constitute the model world economy. So to speak to the development as informative constitution of the world economy privileges these diverse elements which compose it, de-emphasizes an abstract world market that subjugates and determines locales and experiences of locals. So he's very attentive to the agency. It's an agentive kind of agenda he's trying to push here. But nonetheless, Tomich's model was to undermine the deterministic arguments of the world systems and modes of production analysis by producing a method that would grasp the intertwined histories of the world. His approach, I think, is a useful, highly useful corrective from which to deepen the grasp of Caribbean sociocultural histories in their entanglements with global phenomena. In particular, we wish, like Tomich, to lay out a method that does exactly that, but to recognize that Tomich himself is caught up in the power of the economy and to, 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 to open that up to speak to issues related to the economy of power. So we think that that's a useful sort of corrective to make to those o economic over-deterministic models. <coughs> so one needs to shift from this focus on the power of the economy that is the capitalist and wor the capitalist world economy which remains the principal theorized social power constraint even within sophisticated approaches to world systems analysis like Tomich and Phil McMichael to that of economy of power or modern governmentality. Or the array, quote unquote, the array of knowledges and techniques that are concerned with the systematic and pragmatic guidance and regulation of everyday conduct. This shift, we believe, allows for coming to terms more adequately with the conditions as a driving the experiences of both a lived and a systemic crisis within modernity as emphasized by Gilroy in the Black Atlantic and as especially manifest in the ex-slaves experience of the modern world in relation to processes and politics of making place and presence. Secondly, one needs to shift from a Cartesian conception of space as existential and potential possession, a conception that pervades world systems analysis and reinforces its tendency to universalize history. Accordingly, in fleeing the plantation and hence in unsettling discourses on creolization from the plantation enclave, we argue that whilst rooted in geographies of Atlantic spaces, of Atlantic, and I come back to this, of Atlantic spaces as such, the womb of space grounding creolization might well be better understood as a specific kind of ontological conditioning, a kind of a remaking of the self, a kind of remaking of the habitus uh, the, and the necessary relationships between the two. Processes which attend the formation and mapping of cultures of power or culture systems. Seen from these perspectives then, the Caribbean, by extension, American histories are multi-directional, multi making for complex post-colonial creolization processes. I think this is exactly Truyo's point. Creole citizens in the Americas, in the Caribbean, have always negotiated and maneuvered within intertwined histories of diverse but linked places constituting the world economy or world society, and they have done so often from their local transnational vantage point. For staying or dwelling involves critical imagination. The creolization process is always an ongoing dynamic within complex open systems. And this approach, we believe, provides an important step in furthering our understanding of this process and politics of fleeing the plantation through the limboing making and unmaking of subjects and places given the post-creole imaginations homing modern freedom. To take additional steps, what is called for then is a more careful study of the crafted strategical power relationships homing modern freedoms and secondly continued vigilance in taking into account the concrete historical and ethnographic context that is shaping and making 
uh, place and places through modern space. Some questions to consider here, therefore, are what new and different conditions influence its contemporary practices? Are inequality and, struggled and struggle mobilized in the production of local cultures now? And specifically how and in what context is power being exercised, who is in and who is out, and how is citizenship or citizeness, that is the struggle for human, humanity, dignity, economic survival and a place in and through the world now being negotiated? How is agency measured? How is it being expressed? How is it being tempered and how is it being structured? And under what conditions are emancipatory practices pursued how concretely does creolization work in this post-colonial neoliberal economic era? Or in the post-neoliberal era, as happens as the argument made by, you know, uh, Chavez and uh, Morales and uh, who again, to some extent Lula, and um, what is the name of the chap in Ecuador? Um, Hmm? Korea. Korea. See, uh, yes, <laughs> the, the, they are now uh, talking about the post-neoliberal um, situation that's, um, that, that the, 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 they are resisting, in other words, a neoliberal agenda. And Lula, of course, is in between somewhere. Well, how does creolization work in the post-colonial neoliberal or post-neoliberal economic era? In the, of course, in the larger project in the book, these are some of the question that, questions that we sought to, not certainly not the post-neoliberal economic era, we sought to elaborate on. We think the work offers a way of opening up an understanding of the possibilities of making, for making place, space, and newness in uncertain times, which can further the critical politics of, so to speak, fleeing uh, the plantation. Thanks. But I want to sort of just end with this image that is, uh, was um, an installation by the artist Pedro Lash uh, at Duke University. I don't know if you can see the image in the back of the pre-Columbian. What do you see? Yeah, it's not very, uh, you can't pick it up here, but in the, in the back there's, it. yeah, there's a, uh, um, um, uh, actually it's a, a picture of um, the, w one of the princely people or one, um, a member of the Spanish monarchy. Um, it's, this is, this bl black thing that you see there, it's obsidian, it's a mirror actually, it doesn't really show, th you can see the reflection, that's a pre-Columbian image reflected in the um, black, uh, the obsidian, um, which is made from volcanic um, rock, and in the picture there is, behind the image there is the picture of one of the members of, you know, Philippe's court. Um, and the viewer here, you know, would also be, in looking at this, also be re reflected there. And um, I, I thought that this was a, a great visual sort of a representation of uh, a, a, a dynamized, uh, entangled moment. Um, the, the, certainly the, um, the, the, you may interpret it however, whichever way you want, but I, 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 th I thought I would use this. This is a, a new project that I'm developing here, but it also reflects the certain ways in which we can understand the, 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 the dynamic hauntings, if you will, not simply of the past, uh, but uh, a certain kind of interpretation of the past, but also the possibilities, the haunting of the present as well, with the, cur the, 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 the spectator who's looking at the image. Um, presenting a, 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 a different kind of future as well, interpreting it. So there's the past and there's the future that's sort of moving in, a, in, in, in <laughs> I don't know, um, disjunctively as it were. And it seemed to me that this, uh, I have to explore this a little further, have, uh, represents a certain kind of, um, you know, this hauntology, if you will of um, entanglement of, of time in the, in, in, in the Americas. I'm dealing with the Americas in, in this is specific um, chapter. 
Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry.